And now, Daljit Dhaliwal. In many parts of the developing world, daily survival takes precedence over protecting the natural habitat. Illegal logging, overfishing and unsustainable farming practices not only threaten the local environment, but also the livelihood of indigenous communities. Here to discuss how to change attitudes towards conservation at the local level is Nigel Sizer, Vice President of RARE. Nigel, welcome to the program. Thank you. So tell us a little bit about the kinds of environmental threats that your organization is working on right now. Well, examples of two of the most important threats we're dealing with are destruction of tropical rainforests and loss of some of the world's most valuable coral reefs. Tropical rainforests continue to disappear at a very alarming rate. Uh, including where I live in Indonesia, where we're losing about three or four million acres of rainforests every year to development and unsustainable agriculture and, and other investments. And uh, some of the world's most valuable coral reefs are imperiled by, by climate change, overfishing, people using cyanide and dynamite to catch fish quickly for the international market. So some very, very pressing issues that we're focused upon. And tell us a little bit more uh about this reef, why conservation of the reef known as the Coral Triangle is important, uh, especially in the global tropics? Well, the Coral Triangle is, is an area that covers the marine resources of about six countries, Indonesia, Papua New Guinea, Malaysia, the Philippines, East Timor, and some other parts of the region. And it's by far the most diverse area of marine life in the world. And about 3,000 species of fish are found in this area and 75% of the world's corals are found there. It's 10 times the number of species that you would see if you went diving in, in the Caribbean. It's an extraordinary area. Mm. And over and 100... How much of the area has already been lost then? Well, about 70 to 80% of the reefs in the area are considered highly threatened by unsustainable fishing practices. Overfishing, people just catching too many fish, and destructive fishing using the dynamite and cyanide to catch fish quickly, which kills the underlying reef that the fish depend upon, or dragging big heavy nets across the reefs, which destroys them as well. So how does your group uh, try to combat this destruction, especially something like cyanide and dynamite fishing? Presumably this is something that's been going on for many generations. This is how fishermen have decided that they, they want to fish and they're not using traditional fishing methods anymore. How do you convince them that this is wrong and yet give them an alternative? Well, we're focused on training the next generation of environmental leaders in the region. So we take young environmentalists from local organizations and basically put them through an intensive two-year training program during which they learn how to inspire those communities about the importance of these biological resources at the same time as providing them with alternatives and options that they can follow once they decide that they want to change behavior. And what are the advantages of using that approach, you know, working from the bottom up rather than from, from the top down? And how many millions of people do you think that you've been able to influence? Well, we think we've influenced at least five or six million people with our campaigns to date around the world in 150 different sites. We're currently working in about 25 different places in Indonesia alone, training local organizations to address illegal logging, reduce dynamite fishing, uh, combat the illegal hunting of endangered species such as orangutans and so on. And working with the local communities, um, I think you, you see dramatic results for relatively modest investments. Uh, once local people understand the importance of these resources and are inspired to change their behavior because they recognize that what they're living with is a unique heritage that no one else in the planet has, then working with them to provide alternatives, you, you see them sort of taking on an emotional responsibility to become conservationists as well. It's far more effective than just straight law enforcement. Locking people up in jail for illegal logging or hunting orangutans just alienates the local population. Well, I was going to ask you about regulation and enforcement. Uh, just recently, six of the Asia-Pacific nations um, said that they were going to commit to protecting the resources what, what, you know, what is uh, the, the level of enforcement and what is the, the level of regulation here? Is it going to make any real difference to protecting the reef, for example? 
even if they dramatically multiplied the amount of enforcement and improved the regulations in the region, it's still only going to be effective in a relatively small area. We're talking about vast areas of, of ocean and reef, millions of square kilometers, and governments with, with very limited resources and limited capacity. So mobilizing local communities to want to conserve these resources and then working with them to manage those resources really is the key, together with policy change at a higher level, uh, to, to achieve conservation on a large scale. Mm. And these types of degradation that RARE is trying to um, raise awareness about and, and create a, a difference in the minds of people, um, do you think that it, they're going to figure sort of prominently at the United Nations climate change talks in Copenhagen? Yes, um, climate change is key in all of these issues. So at the recent summit of heads of state for the, for the coral triangle and for coral reef conservation uh, that just happened in Indonesia, the key point on the agenda, the key objective of the policy, many of the policymakers at that meeting was to send a message to Copenhagen that we need to have attention to climate change issues in relation to marine conservation. As the oceans warm up and ocean chemistry changes with climate change, many of these reefs are doomed anyway. So we need urgent action on climate change as well. And on forests, Indonesia is the third or fourth largest emitter of greenhouse gases in the world. And 80% of those emissions are due to the clearing and burning of tropical rainforests. So again, forests is a key point on the agenda in Copenhagen. And figuring out how to reward countries like Indonesia, which desperately need support to conserve these resources and reward them for doing that in the context of the climate change processes that are emerging mm -hmm. is, an, is, a, is, a, is absolutely key. And briefly, what are the costs of inaction? The costs of inaction are that unique species like orangutans and tiger will disappear and our children will never be able to see them in the wild, uh, that the world continues to warm because of forests being cleared, and that hundreds of millions of poor people are plunged further into poverty, aggravating the risk of conflict across that region. Nigel Sizer, thank you very much for coming on the program. Thank you very much.